Hello everyone, my name is Pixorifts, and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. Today we're going to look at supporting mechanics for Minecraft's enchanting system. And these are going to be super useful because they allow us to manipulate some of the enchanting mechanics of the game to our greater advantage. The enchantment table has provided us with a couple of really good enchants, namely we got ourselves infinity on a bow along with a couple more enchantments and in the last episode we got fortune 3 on a diamond pickaxe. But previously we got efficiency 4 and only efficiency 4 on this pickaxe. This one only came with fortune 3 and we have a couple of enchanted items already that are pretty low level when we just had the enchanting table and no bookshelves around it. And so the focus of today's episode is going to be about repairing, combining, disenchanting and re-enchanting some of these items that we have. So I'm going to grab some diamonds and some iron and we're also probably actually going to take this cobblestone that I got from our last caving trip. We're going to cook that in a furnace until it smelts down into natural stone and we're going to use that for a little bit of crafting. We can grab some stone out of the furnace. We might only need one stone for this actually because while I was thinking about crafting three natural stone into six stone slabs, we can of course use the stone cutter for this as well. I'm going to drop some natural stone in there and you'll see you can actually craft all sorts of stone brick variants with this but we can get two stone slabs from just the one block of stone and now as you can see in the top right the recipe has unlocked for a workstation called a grindstone we'll need sticks planks and a stone slab for that in this formation and since this is a newer one I don't always remember the recipe for it so I'm very happy the recipe book exists but two planks two sticks and a slab in the center will get you a grindstone while we're down here we're going to craft three iron blocks like so and we're going to craft those along the top of the crafting table there with a stem and a base in the middle. And that will get us an anvil. These two are basically the perfect accompaniment to an enchanting setup like the one we have out here. And so I'm going to put the grindstone over here on one side. I'm probably going to put the anvil in the middle so it rests in between those bookshelves. The placement of these is not important, but I'm just going for the aesthetics right now. The grindstone and the anvil have a couple of similarities, but they also have a couple of notable differences. To start with, I'm going to grab some shears, which I left in this barrel here, both of which have been used to about half their total durability and I'll show you what we can do with those. If we put both of them in the grindstone like this, you will see that the item comes out fully repaired. The grindstone allows you to combine materials. As it says up here, the first word there is repair. You'll notice that the top set of shears has 110 durability left. The bottom set of shears has 124 but the total durability is 238. Adding the durability of these two together would only get you to 234, which wouldn't quite be enough to fill up the durability bar, but as you can see, this set of shears in the output slot is a fully repaired set. So what it does is it combines the two shears and also adds a little bit of durability to make it worth your while combining half broken tools. Now the same functionality is also part of the anvil, but the anvil will charge you enchantment levels in order to do it, and it doesn't do it any better. So for basic tool repairs, you're not going to want to do those in the anvil. In fact, you probably don't want to do them in either the anvil or the grindstone because it's even possible to combine tools like this in your crafting inventory. Like so, if we put those two together, you'll see that they pop out as a perfectly repaired set of shears. And we're actually going to combine those into one set. And as you see, we've got a fully repaired set of shears ready to shear sheep or harvest leaves or whatever we want to do with those. So you might be wondering why the anvil charges you experience levels to combine tools which you can do for free in a grindstone or even do on the go in your crafting interface. And that is because the anvil has other functionality attached to it. Really? <laughs> Am I going to have to explain this in the rain? I think we're going to need to whip up a quick roof for our enchanting setup just so we don't end up getting disturbed by the rain every time I want to do this. Let's use the stone cutter to turn some of the cobbled deep slate we've acquired into deep slate tile slabs. We'll put fences up around the outside. We'll make a couple of slab arches going over the top. I guarantee it's going to stop raining right as I finish this. We'll throw some oak slabs in the middle, maybe a ridge of birch along the center, and it's getting dark so we can already sleep the rain away. <laughs> but hey, at least now it's getting dark, I can show you that the enchantment table emits a little bit of light, which should block mob spawns in a radius around it. 
But anyway, now we have a roof that we don't technically need anymore. I'm going to show you the rest of the anvil mechanics. So the anvil is actually for combining tools while keeping the enchantments on the tools and even combining the enchantments themselves. You'll look at this right now. It's the combination of the two pickaxes put into one. So we have fortune three plus efficiency four for a few extra experience levels we can get one pickaxe that has both of those for an extra level we can even rename it if we wanted to so i could call it pixies fortune factory or something like that i don't know we, we could call it whatever we want and then that would be the name of that tool permanently i'm not going to do that for right now because honestly i think we have a better shot at getting some better enchantments on these and that's why we're going to return to the grindstone because you'll notice the second word here is disenchant so if we put an enchanted item into the grindstone on its own it appears here in the output slot without those enchantments. So protection one from this iron chest plate, gone in an instant. And not only that, we noticed a bit of XP came out of the grindstone. Depending on how many enchantments there are and the overall value of those enchantments, you can actually get a decent amount of experience back by disenchanting something here in the grindstone. So if I wanted to, with my efficiency 4 diamond pickaxe, I could remove the enchantments from it, re-enchant it in the enchantment table, and maybe I would get something a little bit different. Let's throw the iron axe in there. Okay, so we're guaranteed at least on breaking 3 on an iron axe. It might even give us the same enchantments on a diamond pickaxe, since a lot of the tool enchantments come up the same when you put them in the enchantment table. See, the shovel here is coming up with unbreaking 3. I don't know if the sword will, because swords have a different set of enchants, but it also does. So we could be guaranteed about at least getting unbreaking 3 on this pickaxe. I'll explain what unbreaking 3 does once we get it, but the other thing we can do in an anvil is repair durability damage to some of our tools by adding in some of the materials that are used to craft them. Say for example here, I have a diamond pickaxe, if I put a diamond in here, it's going to repair 390 durability that I've lost from this diamond pickaxe. So right now I have 931 durability on it because we've used it quite a bit. Adding a diamond in there gives us 1321 durability. So it's, yeah, about, about 400 durability gets put back onto the pickaxe. If we put a second diamond in here, it would fully repair it, which might actually be a little bit of a loss for us because of the amount of durability that one diamond can usually repair. But say this, say this thing was worn down to about halfway, you could get it basically all the way to fully repaired again if you put two diamonds into it. But if the durability on this diamond pickaxe was worn down to a stub, if it had 100 durability or less on here, three diamonds would not be enough to get it fully repaired. And so at that point, you're probably better off making a brand new diamond pickaxe, combining the two and keeping the enchants, or even enchanting a new diamond pickaxe just to see what you get. For our next example of what the anvil can do, we come down here to the enchanted books chest that we made, and let's grab this Luck of the Sea book. We'll also get a couple of string out of here, craft some sticks from the wood that we've got lying around, which is... Actually, not much, <laughs> but I think we've got enough there with a birch and an oak plank. We're going to place those diagonally in the crafting table and two string off the side gets us a fishing rod. And we'll do a whole episode about fishing because the results from fishing can be pretty spectacular. But importantly, it allows us to use this enchanted book because the book by itself is not going to have any effect. A sharpness book does not do more damage to monsters. But if you combine an enchantable item with an enchantment that it is compatible with, like Luck of the Sea here it applies exclusively to fishing rods, you can enchant that item in an anvil just using a book, bypassing the enchantment table altogether. Now, if I were to put this fishing rods directly into the enchantment table, I'm guaranteed to get a couple of enchantments that definitely aren't on this book. And this book does have a fairly low level enchantment on it. It's only luck of the C1, where potentially the table is going to give me slightly higher level enchantments, but at the cost of needing to get 30 levels and then spending more levels on it. So if we had some decent books, it might be worth returning to the anvil and applying them to this fishing rod. Another thing to consider is the enchantment cost changes depending on what you are combining, and you will often find that combining different tools leads to different results, even if you're combining the same tools but in a different order. For example, Fortune 3 is a very valuable enchantment and it's weighted quite highly in terms of the overall enchantment cost. So to put Fortune 3 on an efficiency 4 pickaxe costs us 14 levels. 
By comparison, efficiency is quite common, so if we put them this way round, we're only applying efficiency 4 to a Fortune 3 pickaxe, and that becomes a little bit cheaper because efficiency is a more common enchantment and you're adding it to something which already has fortune instead of adding fortune to something which has efficiency. Sometimes the maths are there balances out and it turns out the same price no matter which way around you put the items, but occasionally it is worth swapping them around in the repair interface just in case one of the options is a little bit cheaper. Now we've gone over the theory though, let's take a look at what we actually want to do here. Fortune 3 is a pretty valuable enchantment to me, and I think I want to go for Unbreaking on a Diamond Pickaxe, because potentially if we combine that with the Fortune Pickaxe, it's going to last a little bit longer. And Efficiency 4, while it's useful, is potentially going to come up in the enchantment table anytime we enchant a pickaxe. So I'm going to use the grindstone to remove the efficiency enchantment, and as you saw, I got a lot more XP back from that than I did from just disenchanting protection 1 from my iron chest plate. Now we're going to return to the enchantment table, drop the diamond pickaxe in there, and yes, it is giving us unbreaking 3. So all I need to do is go and round up a little bit more experience, and we'll have a diamond pickaxe with an unbreaking enchantment on it, which I think will be very valuable if we can get hold of it. We can also take a look at what the enchanted book will give us, which is sweeping edge protection and lure 2 right now. I I think the diamond pickaxe is going to be the best way forward. Something I didn't cover in our introduction to enchanting, because honestly it takes a lot of explaining, is that a lot of these different enchantments will have different levels. We've already seen a couple of them, right? We had efficiency 4 on this pickaxe, we have fortune 3 here, we have luck of the sea 1. Now the slightly more complicated thing about this is that each enchantment has its own range of levels. Luck of the sea and fortune, for example, range from 1 to 3, while efficiency can range from 1 to 5, and some enchantments don't actually have different levels at all. Unbreaking, which we're currently waiting for from the enchantment table, only goes up as far as 3, so that is the highest level of unbreaking we can get. And the reason I haven't explained all of the different tiers of levels in greater detail is because it's the kind of system that's so much easier for you to learn through practical examples, to learn as you go, instead of me just firing a bunch of numbers at you and expecting to remember them. I would encourage you to experiment with enchanting, do a little bit of research of your own and look up the table in the Minecraft wiki if you want to know exactly what every level of every possible enchantment is. It's going to be a lot easier for you to remember though if you do a bit of that research on your own and just find out what the limits are through experimentation. Right now though I'm going to go looking further afield for ways of getting experience and in the process we can explain a bit more about Fortune 3. If I break one block of coal ore with an unenchanted pickaxe or a pickaxe that doesn't have fortune on it at all, it's only going to drop one piece of coal. I've got 43 in my inventory right now. When I pick one up, I get 44. What fortune does is increase the chances of getting multiple drops from a block like this. Say, for example, I break this block of coal. Now we're at 45, so that block did only give me one. But if I end up breaking away a few of these blocks and breaking a few more of the coal ore blocks now, that one's going to give us one, so that's going to be 46. That one has clearly given us more than one item. As you can see from the item sprites, there are multiple there. We go from 46 to 48, so we just got two bits of coal from that piece. With 49 in our inventory right now, I'm going to break four more blocks. And now we're all the way up to 60. So from those four blocks, I got 11 pieces of coal. That is really the power of fortune. As we continue to mine through this coal vein, we're going to get a bunch more coal from this than we were likely to get otherwise. And fortune is something which now applies to every single ore in the game. In versions before Minecraft 1.17, there were some blocks like iron where you obtained the block itself if you mined it and it didn't drop raw items like iron, copper, and gold do now. The advantage to having that changed in Minecraft 1.17 is that these now drop items which can be fortuned, and where normally we'd only get about 5 copper maximum from a single copper ore block, we just got 10 in a single swing, and there's a chance of getting even more than that, although there's also still a chance of getting as low as 2 or 3. Now naturally, in the early stages of the game when you're still scrounging for tools, fortune can be a massive advantage to you, and it can multiply the amount of diamonds you get from diamond ore as well, meaning you can get up to 4 diamonds 
from a single block of ore. Naturally, that is a real advantage when it comes to gathering materials at this early stage in the game. Caves and ravines like this, areas which have a bunch of resources in, are going to be all the more valuable to us now that we have Fortune on one of our pickaxes. And while Fortune doesn't grant you any more XP from mining than just mining these blocks normally would, it's still going to be a distinct advantage to have a lot more of the resource at the end of the day. I got enough raw copper that I was able to craft it into a few blocks, so we don't have any raw copper left in our inventory. I'm going to break some of this copper ore and we'll see how much we have left after mining out let's say eight blocks of it. That right there was another 52 raw copper from eight blocks. So that is clearly the best way of getting hold of larger amounts of resources like copper. And with just a few more blocks mined, we have over two stacks of raw copper that we can turn into even more copper blocks. So I think it's all gonna be worth bringing back and smelting. This ravine also leads down into an aquatic cave system from the looks of things, which we could potentially explore if we had the opportunity to breathe underwater. Right now, this bubble column here, which I'm going to crouch on top of to make sure I don't take any damage from the magma blocks, is our only source of air. So I think we'll probably leave this place for now and maybe come back with a water breathing potion or even a door that we can place so that we can grab some air while we're down here. The sky seems to be darkening a little bit, so I'm going to place a bucket of water up here so that I can swim out of this ravine and we'll head back to the house with all of the copper that we've managed to harvest. Our latest rainstorm has turned into a thunderstorm, and so I'm going to do the silly thing and stand on top of a tree, mostly because I want to catch the lightning rod up on our roof in action. If lightning decides to strike in this area, it's going to hit the chimney pot up there, and we should avoid it damaging any of the rest of our property. We might also see a few mobs pop out here and there, and in the meantime, I've been harvesting some sugar cane so I can take the leather from the cows that we're breeding and turn it into more books to enchant at the enchantment table. Wow, there it goes. Look at that. That was a direct lightning strike up there on the roof, and... Yep, I don't think anything is burning, <laughs> as far as I can tell at least. With the lightning rod a couple of blocks above there, it's doing its job. Keeping the lightning off the rest of our builds, making sure the wool and the wood doesn't get set on fire. Very, very happy I did that. <laughs> anyway, it's time to get some sleep, because lightning storms are not the kind of conditions I like recording in. And with the rain easing up, we can pull a little bit more copper out of the furnaces here. Looks like we'll need to get a little bit more on the go before we can fully reach level 30, but there should be enough copper in our reserves here. And having returned the rest of it to the basement, I'm going to make a few more books here. We've got the paper, we've got the leather, and 15 books is enough to make ourselves a few more blocks for bookshelves, but I think we're going to save those for a little bit of custom enchanting once we've got what we want out of this enchantment table. Having been out to gather a bit more XP just by killing some animals in the area, the furnaces are done smelting up copper, and at last we have 30 levels once again. So we're going to return to the enchantment table and see if we get anything other than unbreaking three when we re-enchant this pickaxe. Nope, we just got unbreaking three. <laughs> oh well. We could do the same dance again. We could end up disenchanting this in the grindstone and re-enchanting it if we wanted to. Or what I'm going to do is just combine fortune and unbreaking three to get a fortune pickaxe that's going to last a lot longer. Because what Unbreaking 3 does is introduce an element of chance into whether or not your tool loses durability when you mine a block. So for example, if I put down a few blocks of cobblestone here and we check out the durability on my pickaxe right now, no durability has been lost, so we're not going to see any numbers for that yet. If I break this block here, you'll see that the durability bar hasn't appeared and it hasn't lost any durability on the tool. I break another block here, still no. I break another block here, still no. If I break a few more blocks, the durability bar only appears once I've mined eight blocks total, and we've only lost one point of durability. Now, like Fortune, that is based on an element of chance, so it is still possible for us to lose durability every block we hit, but it's not as likely anymore. And in fact, the protection provided by Unbreaking 3 means that this pickaxe will probably last about four times as long as it would otherwise. So while the durability on the tool is still about 1,500, we can expect this pickaxe to last for roughly 6,000 blocks worth of mining, which is a lot better than it was. 
There are still some upgrades we can make to this pickaxe, including adding efficiency to it. And goodness knows I would like efficiency because it feels a little bit slow breaking blocks. Now we've gone back to a pickaxe which doesn't have efficiency. But rather than combine the pickaxe with another diamond pickaxe, which we have the diamonds to do, we could also look at enchanting some books and seeing if an efficiency enchantment comes up at any point in the table. It doesn't look like we're going to get that right now. We have a power four enchantment here, which could go on a bow. We already have power three, so that's not a huge upgrade. And if we want to, we could put this book into the enchantment table, enchant it with a low level thing that's only gonna cost us one level, like protection one. Then we can check what comes up on the next enchanted book. It's giving us feather falling, sharpness, loyalty. We don't really need any of those right now. We can disenchant the protection one enchantment from that book. We can put a book back in here, enchant it with the most basic level enchantment again, pop a book back into the interface. Now we're getting knockback, smite, bane of arthropods. And so in theory, if we want to get a specific enchantment on a book so we can just add it to the pickaxe instead of wasting more diamonds on combining two pickaxes, all we would need to do is enchant a few more books until it came up with something we were looking for. Now it's giving us a low level efficiency enchantment, protection one, and then feather falling four, which can potentially go on a set of boots to prevent us taking as much fall damage. There are a lot of different options. And in the meantime, we could be looking to get more useful enchantments on our sword, which is now showing up on breaking three. The shovel is showing fortune two, which I'm going to avoid, but there are a few other enchantments that we could be getting on tools or armor in the meantime. Time. And thanks to the grindstone, if we disenchant those books, we're always going to get a bit of XP back. And it's not the amount that it cost us to enchant the book in the first place, but it's still going to be worthwhile. Now, once we've gathered a few more logs from this area and crafted ourselves a diamond axe, because it's one of the only tools left in my inventory which isn't made of diamond, we're probably going to do a little bit more caving because now we have Fortune 3 on our side. We have the potential to get the most amount of diamonds possible out of any block of diamond ore now, so there's no need to hold back when we're going caving. We can explore to our heart's content and as long as we survive, we can make sure we return with the maximum amount of loot that we're going to get from a caving run. And with our iron axe gone, there we go. We have full diamond tools, or close enough. We still don't have a diamond hoe, but we don't need to worry about hoes for a little while. Instead, with with plenty of wood, coal, and food on us, let's make our way back across the sea to that giant cavern we were exploring off of the lush cave, and let's see if we can find ourselves some more diamonds. On my way back to the giant cavern, I realized we reached this Y intersection where I never went down the right-hand path, so I'm gonna quickly hop down here to see if this leads down into the same cave system, gathering some of the resources that I spot as I go. And now from four blocks of iron, we have eight raw iron. So we're already multiplying all of this stuff. And that kind of points to what you can expect from the output of fortune. Even though it is possible to, in some cases, quadruple the output of some of those ore blocks, chances are you'll maybe double the output from the ores you mine at most, because on average, you're still only going to be getting one or two from some of those blocks of iron when you could be getting a maximum of four. But it looks like we have stumbled upon something very special and something we will probably return to in a future episode. If you see granite and copper generating like this, where there are sections of granite with lots of copper ore dotted around in ones and twos, chances are you have found a huge vein of copper. I didn't know this was here. This is fantastic to find, actually, because yeah. seeing this is an indication of the fact that the copper generation is going to continue for a long way in a vein that we can follow for potentially hundreds of blocks and get tons and tons of copper out of it. And look at this. There's even a full block of raw copper generating in this place. Incredible. We have a bunch of copper around here. If we dig out some of the granite, we might find more copper ore. If we dig away the copper ore, we find more granite and we can keep going into the earth with this vein and find tons and tons of copper. Copper is not exactly what we're here for right now. We're looking for a few more diamonds and things so we can continue getting geared up, but we will return to this spot for sure because if we continue to follow this vein, who knows how much copper we'll end up with later.
The cave also branches out from here into a couple of different directions, and I might just grab a couple of bits and pieces from here, but I'm not going to explore too far now I know that this huge copper vein is here, because I want to see how much copper we can get out of that thing if we mine out the entire vein. So we're going to do that in a future episode, probably when I've got an efficiency pickaxe, because that will make the mining stage a lot faster. Right now, though, I'm going to return to the cavern and keep looking around, and I'm going to try and keep my inventory as free of other blocks as possible. Of course, we want to keep our sword around. We're going to condense some of the ores down into blocks of ore as we go. We've got some wood that we can use to craft some more torches, but ideally, all our inventory wants to be is torches, tools, a couple of things for safety like a boat and a water bucket, some wood for torches, and then all of the raw materials that we're gathering, all of the precious stuff that we're getting from this caving run. And maybe we'll need to keep a couple of blocks on us for things like pillaring up and down, but I think for the most part we're going to just fill up our inventory with ores and see how much we can collect. We'll still need to be careful of mobs down here because my armor is still unenchanted iron, so I'm going to be trying my best to stay away from too much open combat, but now we're down here we can definitely do a little bit more exploring and find some of the ores that we missed on our last trip. Redstone ore is one of the ores that is most heavily affected by Fortune. Normally redstone will drop a lot of items if you mine it with a regular pickaxe, but with Fortune 3 the drops should go through the roof and we end up with a lot more redstone dust than we started with. That was I think 6 or 7 blocks of redstone ore and we have 38 redstone dust to show for it. There's some lapis ore right here, I've already broken one block of it and got 5, we'll break another couple of blocks. Now uh, we got 11, and from four blocks total, we have 56 lapis, so that is incredible. We must have got 20 from a couple of those, or close enough at least. That is a phenomenal amount of lapis right there. Let's get a little bit more redstone dust from up here, and then let's venture out into the rest of the cave where the baby zombies are already running at me. Unfortunately for them, I have a punch bow, which is a pretty effective weapon if you're good with your aim. And behind this redstone, we found some diamonds, so this is going to be our first chance to mine up some diamond ore with fortune. Let's open this out and see if there's a larger vein hiding behind it. Looks like it might just be a couple of blocks. We'll grab the redstone here first, and with two blocks of diamond ore, let's see how many diamonds we get out of it. It's looking like one. And then two, just two, okay, <laughs> alright. Then that wasn't the best demonstration of what Fortune is capable of. Let's find some more diamonds. We're also encountering areas with a lot of deep slate iron generating, and Fortune is just as effective on deep slate ores as it is on stone ores, so wherever I see the iron, I'm going to gather that up as well. With the amount of mobs crawling out of the darkness, it looks like I'm going to get as much XP from fighting mobs as I am from mining. We'll need to watch our back for creeper attacks, but coming over this way into the lush cave might present a couple of interesting opportunities, because the moss in these areas will not overgrow any of the ore blocks. So while there might be some under the moss carpet here and there, I think it's going to be a good idea to take a look at the walls around here, take a look at the floor, and see if there are any patches of ore that have been left uncovered by the world generation. Not to mention the biome is just beautiful. I mean, look at this. <laughs> There's a couple of axolotls playing in the background. There are skeletons roaming in the darkness, but this whole area lit up with glow berries looks spectacular. My inventory is already starting to fill up with lots of redstone dust, so I'm going to turn some of those into blocks blocks to save a bit of space. We'll probably do the same with lapis as well. Throw out the rotten flesh and the spider eyes and stuff for now. I might keep the gunpowder just because it is occasionally useful, but yeah, keeping all of these ores and stuff straight in our inventory is going to be worthwhile. We've got our first gold over here, so let's grab some of the raw gold. We have another geode, it looks like. we got some smooth basalt right here. I'm not certain if this is the geode that I've mined into before and we've just come around to it from a different direction, I guess. Let's find out. No, this certainly isn't the same geode because it had some diamond ore in the wall over here, as I recall, so that's a really nice find, right next to a lush cave and everything. Let's find a fully grown crystal, which look like that one up there and this one here, because of course Fortune will also affect things which aren't ore blocks, like for example these crystals here. They will drop potentially more amethyst shards, we got four from that one, let's see if we get any more from this one in the center here. 
And that one dropped 16. So you can see the difference there. The range increases with fortune. So you can still get as few as four amethyst shards, but you can get as many as 16. Pushing forward into these caves, I'm running into areas where we stopped exploring in the previous episode because supplies were running a little bit low. We ran out of torches and I didn't want to push my luck fighting my way through the caves. Now we are better equipped and we have a fortune pickaxe. We can come down here and claim so many more resources that we have left behind in this area before. And Thoroughly exploring an area like this can be one of the most rewarding things about going caving in Minecraft. For the moment, I am going to turn some of the deep slate into a furnace just so we can smelt another piece of iron and I just need one so I'm probably just going to smelt that with sticks and turn the remaining sticks into a few more torches because I need another shield. My shield is really low on durability and I don't want to be left without a shield in areas where we're encountering this many mobs so I'm going to quickly craft myself another one. We'll swap that into my offhand and I'll probably just chuck out this shield because while we could repair it it's sort of not worth doing that when shields are relatively cheap to craft. If iron is looking scarce then you may want to consider combining them but the rest rest of the time you shouldn't need to worry too much about that. Now there's a couple of lava falls in this area and a couple of resources around them like the redstone ore that I want to make sure things are left a little bit safer so we're going to use some blocks very carefully come up here and cut off this lava closer to the source meaning the rest of the lava will flow away. We'll probably block off the water here as well and that will allow us to get the redstone ore without any undue fuss. And this looks like it may have been a good move because this cave goes off into the distance and I can see ores all over the walls here. In fact, there's a patch of tuff there and a little bit of spotty iron generation. So once again, I'm looking out for the potential for a huge iron vein down here. There's another geode right here. You can tell from the smooth basalt, it is cunningly concealed in the deep slate around it, but we can definitely crack into a few more geodes when we come back down here in future. There is plenty of gold in the walls and the ceilings around here too, so we're definitely taking advantage of the gold while it's here. And any narrow offshoots of cave generation are potentially going to be worth exploring for a chance of digging deeper and finding some diamond ore. Although in this case, I found some diamond ore by climbing this region like a staircase. Let's see if we can get a few more diamonds out of this than we did out of the last one. Is it just going to be one block of diamond ore? I have a feeling it is. Unfortunate, but hey, I'll take it. It's better than nothing. And this one looks like it's only dropped one diamond as well. <laughs> the lesson I'm trying to teach here is that fortune can multiply your diamonds, but the lesson the game wants you to learn is that fortune is not a guarantee. <laughs> Well, I'm exploring every nook and cranny I can find right now in order to get hold of some diamond ore, and it looks like we've stumbled upon another patch here, and this looks at least a little promising. We've got two diamond ore resting here in the ground. Looks like, once again, it might just be another two. Let's see if we can get more than one diamond out of each of these blocks. That one definitely dropped more than one. That one, it looks like, just dropped one, though. We've got three on us so far. And that has now <laughs> increased to eight. So that means we got one out of that block, but four out of the other block. Once again, the full range on display right there. And if we wanted to, we could turn these diamonds into any piece of diamond armor right now. We could use all eight of them on a diamond chest plate, which would really increase our armor. But I think we're going to start with a diamond helmet for now, because that's going to leave us with three diamonds free to make ourselves another diamond pickaxe. Because fortune is not the only enchantment we're looking for on a diamond and pickaxe we're hopefully going to get hold of silk touch at some point and i'll explain more about silk touch when we get hold of it but for now at least the game has finally given me an example of how fortune can help you get hold of a few more diamonds the other incredible thing about this cave system is that it almost seems to go on forever there are so many twists and turns and large areas that lead out to even bigger areas and so i'm finding it really fun just wandering around this cave exploring of course once you reach the point where you're running out of cave to explore if that ever becomes a problem you can do what we did in the previous episode we were down here, we can dig down to the lowest points of the world, kind of closer to the Y, negative 53, 54, 55, 56, 57 or so. I think 58 is probably the lowest we can go before we start to encounter bedrock regularly. And we can start a branch mine here, simply by digging in a straight line and then branching off every couple of blocks or so to our left and our right. And chances are that we'll find even more resources concealed inside the walls, because the game does generate a certain amount of diamond ore, which is not exposed to the open air inside of caves, which means that it can sometimes be found inside of flooded 
sections of caves, but more often than not is concealed behind the blocks of the terrain around you. And as I explained previously, the further down in the world you go, the higher the chance of encountering diamonds, and that is true of the blocks which are hidden down here inside the walls as well. So I'm going to dig around for a little while longer and I'll bring you guys back in when we inevitably, hopefully, find that patch of diamonds. Well, that didn't take very long at all, did it? It looks like we've encountered a pretty sizable vein of diamonds here. If it's not eight, then it's at least pretty close. I'm thinking maybe five or six. Yeah, looks like it's a nice little tidy vein of five. Okay, so we've got three diamonds on us right now. Let's break each of these with fortune and see how many we have at the end of that. 14. Okay, so from five blocks there, we got 11 diamonds. That is, once again, about twice the amount of blocks we broke. So, yeah, you can, on average, expect to get two or slightly over two diamonds per block overall on average with fortune three well it took a little bit longer to find the second patch than the first but we've just stumbled on a vein of what looks to be another five diamond ores. so with 14 diamonds currently in our inventory let's fortune the rest of these as well and see how many we end up with this time 22. A 22 is the exact number I was looking for because that's enough for the remaining set of diamond armor and a diamond pickaxe or another diamond tool to go with it. So I think we're probably going to wrap things up down here and make our way back to the house. Well folks, all in all, that was a very successful caving trip. Our fortune pickaxe has taken a little hit in durability, but a single diamond could repair that or in future we will look at other ways of repairing our tools which will be much more effective in the long term. For now though, we have some diamond armor to craft and my armor is looking a little mismatched right now. I think we can do something about that. Let's make ourselves a diamond chest plate, some diamond leggings like so, and some diamond boots. And we now have a very powerful set of armor that we can equip that's going to fill up our armor gauge and guarantee that we have almost the best in protection. Of course, all of this new diamond armor still needs enchanting, but it is more durable, it has more armor rating, it is generally a lot better than what we've been working with with the iron armor. So the iron armor can be retired for now, and it looks like we have plenty of resources that we can smelt if we want to get a little bit more XP for enchanting. So I think this has been a very successful episode, and I think that is where we are going to call it for today. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. My name has been Pixorifs. Please don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to my channel if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now. Thank you.